Good morning and welcome to our first common prayer of the 2010-2011 academic year. My name is Howard Ebert. I'm a member. <laughs> later, later. <laughs> well, that's getting thrown off my script immediately. So, uh, I think I still am a member of the religious studies faculty. Uh, the theme for our common prayer today is a pilgrim's guide to living. Before I begin, I believe some clarification is needed, especially given that the song I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For by U2 isn't probably usually connected to the majority of our minds with the pilgrim's idea. Uh, this along with the response I received from my family that the pilgrim idea is a nice Thanksgiving prayer service to add uh, made me think that some clarification is necessary. So this week in my theology courses, I did a quick word association um, activity with my uh, students, and they were very gracious in, in doing this with me, and I gave them six words, and one of them was pilgrim. And that's really the word I was after. I gave them some other things, too. <laughs> I was really interested, what's the first thing you think of when you hear the word pilgrim? Lo and behold, Thanksgiving was the first. Mayflower, turkey, dressing, Plymouth Rock, and Big Hats. <laughs> um, so rather than focusing, though, on a, on a particular religious group, one that founded the Plymouth Colony in 1620, I have in mind a much broader notion of pilgrim. The broader notion is present in some form in all the world religions, for they encourage and, in fact, many require a pilgrimage to a particular location or site, be that Mecca, Jerusalem, Angie's, to name a few. The term is also used in non-religious contexts. You hear people talk about making a pilgrimage to Lambeau Field, or to some other sports venue, or more seriously and profoundly to the location of the Twin Towers, the Vietnam Memorial, or Auschwitz. So what is a pilgrim more broadly conceived? What distinguishes a pilgrim from a tourist, a traveler, a nomad, a refugee. All these terms designate one who travels. Similarly, all may be undertaking a journey in response to a deep need, a desire, a restlessness, and an incompleteness. Richard Rohrheiser, in our first reading, observes this deep restlessness, and what you too was just singing about, is a constant for all humanity, for all of us. In contrast, though, to a tourist, a traveler, or a nomad, a pilgrim responds to this deep desire by undertaking a journey not into uncharted territory, not to escape, but rather to retrace the steps of those who have gone before to find wisdom, inspiration, and transformation. In a sense, a pilgrim undertakes a journey to be changed to be transformed for the good of oneself and for others. This desire to see and live more deeply is supported by a pilgrim's capacity to take the long view and to recognize the com communion, dare I say, communio, that he or she shares with all those who have traveled and will travel the journey. These essential traits of a pilgrim, the desire to change, taking a long view, and recognizing that he or she is not alone in the journey are qualities not only that serve the pilgrim well, but are worthy of our reflection and our emulation as we begin this new academic year. Gracious, loving God, we praise you for the transformative power of your love. From the beginning of time, you have summoned forth new and marvelous forms of life, beauty, and goodness. We thank you for and relish in the wonders of your creation. May we come to recognize that we are on a pilgrimage to you, who is the source <clears throat> and goal of all of our deepest longings and desires. In us, you have planted an ability, a desire, a restlessness to continue your creative work. Daily, you beckon us to grow into the mystery of your love. May we, sustained by your, by your grace, present in the friendship of our fellow pilgrims, have the courage 
to witness to your love and transform the world to be more reflective of your abiding and constant presence. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The following is an excerpt from The Holy Longing by Richard Roll, uh, Ronald Rollheiser. It is no easy task to walk this earth and find peace. Inside of us, it would seem, something is at odds with the very rhythm of things, and we are forever restless, dissatisfied, frustrated, and aching. We are so overcharged with desire that it is hard to come to simple rest. Desire is always stronger than satisfaction. Put more simply, there is within us a fundamental dis-ease, an unquenchable fire that renders us incapable in this life of ever coming to full peace. This desire lies at the center of our lives in the marrow of our bones, and in the deep recesses of the soul. We are not easeful, easeful human beings who occasionally get restless, serene persons who once in a while are obsessed by desire. The reverse is true. We are driven persons, forever obsessed, congenitally diseased, living lives, as Thoreau once suggested, of quiet desperation, only occasionally experiencing peace. Desire is the straw that stirs the drink. This deep desire expresses itself in different moods and faces. Sometimes it hits us as a pain, dissatisfaction, frustration, and aching. At other times, its grip is not felt as painful at all but as a deep energy, as something beautiful, as an inexorable pull, more important than anything else inside us, toward love, beauty, creativity, and a future beyond our limited present. Desire can show itself as aching pain or delicious hope. Spirituality is, ultimately, about what we do with that desire. What we do with our longings, both in terms of handling the pain and the hope they bring us, that is our spirituality. Thus, when Plato says that we are on fire because our souls come from beyond, and that beyond is, through the longing and hope that its fire creates in us, trying to draw us back toward itself, he is laying out the broad outlines for spirituality. Likewise for Augustine when he says, you have made us for yourself, Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Spirituality is about what we do with our unrest. A pilgrimage does not begin with the pilgrim's first step. No, rather the journey begins well before the packing, the planning, the scheduling, and the goodbyes. It begins with the acknowledgement and affirmation of a deep, haunting need, a deep, haunting desire, a need and a desire and unrest that moves one to act. While there are myriad ways to deny or ignore or flee or extinguish this unrest, a pilgrim acknowledges the deep need and takes action. In other words, a pilgrim takes the initiative to put her or himself in a position where they will be made to change, not only physical location, but change their very sense of themselves and their world. A pilgrim wishes to return home a changed transformed a better person. Isn't this also our wish? 
We come to this academic community to be changed, to be transformed. In a real sense, this decision, like that of a pilgrim's, is strange. For our decision actually will make our lives more difficult, more complex, and more insecure. Like the pilgrim's journey, our decision will entail hardship, challenges to our comfortable existence, and to our well-organized routines. How many students have already experienced this as they negotiate their room assignments? Their roommates apparently strange obsessions or different or lack of basic organizational skill. Also, how many students have already experienced a whole new vocabulary along with words they can neither say, spell, or understand? Also, how many of the staff, faculty, and administration have already encountered new and distinctive attitudes, perspectives, behaviors that at the best moment seems intriguing, different, or challenging? So why put ourselves in a new, often uncomfortable situation? Why be around people, ideas, organizations that challenge and stretch us? Once again, I think the pilgrim's experience offers some guidance. A pilgrim recognizes that withdrawing into a comfortable isolation is not only impossible, but unhealthy. The very impetus at the heart of the unrest we all experience is not to turn to, into ourselves, but to open ourselves to a world in mystery beyond our understanding, beyond our control. This is why a pilgrim leaves the comfort of her or his home and moves into a world that is both fascinating and terrifying. For it is in this world that the living God is encountered. It is in this spirit that we ask God to fill our lives, our journeys with God's grace and love as we sing one spirit, one church.
following words are attributed to Archbishop Oscar Romero. The Archbishop served the people of El Salvador, was a voice for the poor and the marginalized, and was assassinated in 1980 while he was saying Mass in San Salvador. It helps now and then to step back and take a long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is a way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything. And there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something, and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders. Ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. Amen. Being on a pilgrimage requires a long view. Otherwise, the hardships, frustra frustrations, f fatigue can lead to despair. Archbishop Romero's reflection that we just heard articulates beautifully such a long view. More powerfully, his life and untimely death exemplifies his embrace of this longer view. During his life, Archbishop Romero moved from a spirituality that was often centered on the next life and was disconnected with the concerns of ordinary people to a spirituality that embraced and found inspiration in the lives of the poor, the rejected, and the oppressed. This change, this transformation, did not occur overnight, nor did it occur easily. It occurred over time. As Archbishop Romero walked with the poor, those considered the nobodies of the society. He left the world of ecclesial privilege, of comfortable surroundings, of a comfortable God with all its comfortable trappings to be with and to travel with the poor day in and day out. It is his pilgrimage with the poor that led him to see the importance of human effort and its limitations and partiality. At the same time, it led him to a recognition of the deep and abiding and at times troubling love of a living God. As a pilgrim, he saw that every step is necessary, but every step is simply that, a step, in and towards the great mystery of a beckoning God. As we enter a new academic year, we, like pilgrims, beginning their journey, are filled with great anticipation and hope. Yet we know there are obstacles and frustrations ahead. I'll just name a few. Exams, papers, deadlines, losses. In these pleasant and unpleasant moments, it is wise to take the long view, to temper our aspirations, and to soften our disappointments. 
For Romero, it was his long view that affirmed the value of every second, of every decision, of every life, and he found its basis in a living God who loves and surprises us. Romero's pilgrimage with the poor also underscores another central characteristic of a pilgrim's experience. We are never alone. A pilgrim walks the path mapped out by those who have gone before, trusting in the wisdom of past generations of seekers. At St. Norbert College, we too rely on the wisdom of the past, the insights and inspirations of the past as embodied in the Catholic, liberal arts, and Norbertine traditions. Traditions rich and diverse in grappling with the most fundamental questions of human existence. Why are we alive? Why must we die? Does it matter what we do? Is it worth the effort to care and to love? And education at St. Norbert College is a pilgrimage into these traditions. A, pil a pilgrim also walks with others. Think of the pictures of pilgrimages and the throngs of people who are working and walking together. Look around this church, this campus. Students, faculty, staff, and administration are our fellow pilgrims, each traveling alongside us. At the best moments, we are present to each other to share the joys and the pains of this journey. And then there will be those who come after us. I must say, this recognition is very powerful for me. I'm going to get nostalgic here for a while, but 40 years ago, I was a freshman at St. Norbert College. And uh, I haven't changed, but the <laughs> buildings have and so forth. But certainly a sense of continuity and of the 112 years of history of this place. In a moment, we will be singing the litany of saints. As we recall particular saints of the tradition, we take time to recall those in our families, communities, in this academic community who have helped or inspired us along the way.
As you may have already sensed, the experience and witness of the pilgrim has not only important guidance and inspiration to offer us for this academic year, but for our lives. For if the great religious traditions are correct, we are all on a pilgrimage into the mystery of life, love, goodness, happiness, and beauty, a mystery that many traditions and people call God. And of course, all pilgrims need way stations, places of rest, rejuvenation, and reflection. How appropriate that we meet weekly here in this church as a way station on our pilgrimage. For this spot has served over 100 years as a place for fellow pilgrims to celebrate birth, love, and the death of loved ones. And this fall, as we relish the beauty of this campus cathedral with its glorious autumn colors, let us remember a, fil a fellow pilgrim, Father Anselm Keefe, who wanted every indigenous tree or native tree to Wisconsin to be planted on this campus. It is because of his foresight, his determination, that he has made possible for us the experience of a beautiful fall, a beautiful campus. Seeing as it is the beginning of a new academic year, I want to make very clear that there are no announcements at Common Prayer. That's why I'm making a couple concluding remarks. <laughs> <laughs> and 1042, Howard, very nicely done. Okay, quickly, we want you to know, number one, as we start this academic year together, we have refreshments after Common Prayer today. For those of you new to our community, a special welcome, and we're so glad you joined us today. We're sad to say snacks aren't here every week, but they're here this week, so you picked a good day to come. Um, so we hope if you have time, linger for a moment and enjoy your refreshment. If you're very busy, grab and go with our blessing. That's fine. And our second announcement is to let you know that next week's Common Prayer is on the road. We will be in Tawir Hall um, to bless the reflection space in that hall on the ground floor. That will be Common Prayer. We'll have signs on the doors here and signs outside of Tawir Hall to try to help you remember. But spread the word. Um, during the regular time, beginning at 1010, Common Prayer will be in Tawir Hall next Wednesday. Until then, have a wonderful day. On your way out the door, don't fail to wish Father Sal a happy birthday. <laughs>